Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a double header because we're going to do a family portrait. Yes, a family portrait video. We haven't done one of those in a long, long time. In fact, if you go back through my videos and you go sort by oldest to newest, you'll notice that many of the early videos that I did uh, were either vintage unboxings or they were um, family portraits because I was trying to knock out some of the biggest, the houses that I have the most bottles in. Stuff like Chanel, Creed, Amouage, Guerlain, that kind of stuff, you know. And then once we got the big houses out of the way, I did the ones that I still had a lot of bottles of, but not, you know, um, not as many as the original video. So we started to do some Hermes and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and there's a bunch of houses I realized that I just never covered. I knocked out the biggest houses and then I stopped. So today we're going to do a double header, uh, two houses. It's going to be the house of Aramis and it's going to be the um, house, the niche house of Papillon. And I, the reason we're going to talk about the niche house of Papillon today, well, first of all, I love Liz Moore's work, okay? So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get to the full bottles that I have in my collection. I purchased the full bottles with my own money. Uh, but uh, there is a friend in the fragrance community who I'll try not to, um, you know, show any addresses on here. But he sent me a Lismore sample set that Lismore sent to him for me. Uh, so Nick, thank you very much, my friend. I really do appreciate it. It's very kind of you, so we are going to do this unboxing, if you will, after we talk about the fragrances in my collection, and so I have more first impressions to do. I don't know why I stopped exploring from this house, because what I've smelled from her, I really like. I like way more than other, you know, niche houses that I would put in the same, that people put in the same category as her. Um, work. So, you know, a lot of people compare her house to something like Francesca Bianchi. I think Liz, Moore, Liz Moore's work is far superior to, to Francesca Bianchi. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, and so, you know, we're going we're gonna to go through this and I've got a lot of first impressions now to do on the house of Papillon. So, um, let's get started. The first thing we are going to talk do is the usual scent of the day because I like sharing this stuff with you guys. Uh, it's a way to talk about fragrances, what I'm wearing, that kind of stuff. And today's scent of the day is a uh, Atat Libre d'Orange fragrance and it's called Je suis un homme or I am man if I uh, get the um, translation properly. And wow, I absolutely love this fragrance. First of all, this is my favorite Atat Libre d'Orange, Eldo fragrance, if you will. I like it better than the Afternoon of a Fawn, which is still a fantastic fragrance. Uh, I like it better than Tom of Finland, which is the other full body, full bottle that I have from this brand. Um, and I think those are the only, oh, and Rien. So for me, it would probably be uh, Je suis un homme and then Rien, and then toss up between the Afternoon of a Fawn and Tom of Finland. But this is my favorite one from the brand, and what I love about it is it's this spicy, woody, leathery scent, and it's the leather that really gets me in this, and it's an Antoine Lee creation. It's my favorite Antoine Lee creation, I think, as well. High praise. Now, I haven't smelled the stuff he did, he did for Eugene yet. I can't wait to smell that. Um, hopefully very soon I will get my hands on a sample or a bottle or something like that, but I am currently in my no buy July, so uh, I'm not buying anything right now, but, um, I can't wait to smell his stuff. And this fragrance has, you know, a passing resemblance to something like Hermes Bellamy. Okay, so if you love Bellamy, uh, I would urge you to give Je suis un homme a try. Now, this is a vintage bottle. You can tell by the cap is one way. You can also tell by just how raised the um, writing on the sticker is. See how it almost looks like it's um, like it is raised. It's not just a sticker. There's some 3D depth to it. 
the older stickers are much more pronounced and they have this metallic gun cap, um, metallic gun metal cap with nothing on top. So the newer bottles, the caps look like this. So you can see it's more shiny, it's silvery, and it has the name of the house on top. This is the older version. So I don't know if there's been a reformulation of uh, Je Suis Un Homme. I've never smelled the new juice, if you will. Uh, but I will say that, um, you know, this is absolutely fantastic. And if you know Antoine Lee's past, he claims that one of the biggest influencers for him was uh, Bellamy. That Bellamy to him was a big influence in his career, in, in his taste. And um, you can really see it in this fragrance. It, it really will remind you of Bellamy, but a niche version of it because there's more going on here that you don't get in Bellamy. Bellamy is my favorite fragrance of all time. It's an 11 out of 10 for me. It is that fragrance that it just encapsulates what I want in a fragrance. And um, on a quick tangent, by the way, I sent samples to Russian Adam uh, of Arige Ladore. And, you know, if you haven't watched my Russian Adam interview, go do it. But we are going to do another interview together. And we're going to try to make it happen this week. Probably Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Probably Wednesday, actually. But, um... Stay tuned for sure. I'll let you guys know tomorrow in tomorrow's video if we get it verified. But we're, we could potentially do it as a live stream where you guys can maybe try to interact and that kind of stuff. Um, whereas last time I just did it one-on-one -on -one with us since it was our first interview together. Um, but stay tuned for that. But the reason that that just hit me is I want to tell you guys we're going to do another interview together. And also, uh, he wore... Bellamy's sample that I gave him and he loved it enough to buy a full bottle himself and he um, said he was really impressed with the ability of the perfumer to create something amazing in Bellamy uh, and you know it doesn't have the expensive high-end notes that you find in some of that you know indie um, high high class indie fragrance um, you know tier that Russian Adam kind of works in there's no ambergris, there's no real musk, you know, there's no heavy or real oud in it. And so, you know, um, learning about those vintage uh, compositions can really change the way that you look at fragrances. And he loved Bellamy, that made me very happy. He also loved Heritage, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that during our interview next time. But this is one I just want to spend a little bit of time on to tell you, you know, scent of the day, if you like that kind of leather with some animalic notes. There's even a cognac note, but I don't, if you're buying it for the boozy note, you might be disappointed. If you buy it more for the leather and, you know, the spicy woodiness, I think you'll really like this fragrance. Okay, so let's get into the, um, Let's get into the family portrait. So the two fragrances or the, the two houses we're going to talk about are the house of Aramis and the house of Papillon. So let's start with Aramis. Aramis goes back to um, 1964 as far as, you know, uh, Estee Lauder having a men's line. That's what Aramis was about. It was going to be a men's line of, of perfumery or cologne, as they called it back then. And the great Bernard Chant actually was the one to do the fragrances. And I think he did most of the old stuff up until the newer fragrance or two. These are gonna be Bernard Chant creations. So the first one we're gonna start with is 1964, and this is the original Aramis. Now you'll notice my bottle says cologne down there. Actually, both of my bottles say cologne. I have two versions. As you can see, the Aramis, the style that it's written in, the gray background, um, the fact that the 50 ml down here is different from, it's not listed here. Show these are different versions, um, but it's the same, this is the same juice to me. I can't smell any difference between these two, but what I will say is if you can find a version, whether it's a spray or a splash of Aramis Cologne, that's what I would urge you to go for because the cologne indicates it's an older bottle before they started doing the standardized eau de toilette. And once they switched to eau de toilette, you know, it's not as heavy. It's not as, it's not as, um, what would you say? It's not as, it doesn't have as much depth 
as the older bottles that I've smelled. So if you can get one that says cologne, even if it's in a newer bottle, uh, if it looks like it's in one of the newer bottles, if it says cologne, it's still old enough to where, you know, you're going to be safer as far as reformulations go. But this is one of the best masculines ever released, 1964. I'm actually shocked I haven't done one on the House of Aramis. I think I did one on Estee Lauder, though, and we talked about all of the fragrances, but I wanted to highlight the House of Aramis individually so it would be easier for people to find. I do have a watch list. You can go watch all of the family portraits in one place if you would like, back to back to back. Um, and this is, you know, Bernard Shaw uses aldehydes like no one, no other perfumer I've ever smelled. You know, he uses aldehydes to perfection. And there is a little bit of this aldehydic top. But what I love is, um, what I absolutely love about Aramis is how it tends to be this pivot point. You know, it, it was such an influential fragrance. It has this, um, it has this green, this heavy greenness to it with the Artemisia, but there's also, um, so there's a lot of green notes. There's Artemisia, thyme, myrtle, uh, there's spiciness of cardamom and clover, but there's this, even though it's heavy and in your face, there's patchouli, there's leather. I love the leather in the base, uh, sandalwood and castorium. So it does go a little bit animalic. There's also orris root. And I mentioned many times that combination of leather and orris root or iris uh, is absolutely stunning in a fragrance. And this is big time masculine, old school, in your face. And I absolutely love it. And that's why I have two bottles. Anytime you see me with two bottles, you know it's a pure love for me. And uh, this is probably my favorite Aramis fragrance. The one that started it all in 1964. Okay, so let's go to, we're going to go in chronological order here. So next, we're going to go to um, the year 1973. Okay, so nine years in the future, Bernard Chant uh, released this little beauty. It's called Aramis 900. Now, um, this, is the, this is the original version. This is what it looked like. Um, it, it looked like this, and it said Herbal Cologne Spray. Now, they re-released it, of course, in the same uh, gentleman's collection. That The bottle will look like this, basically. This is what the bottle will look like. This is the Havana bottle, but they put it, they put all of the gentleman's collection in here. So when I said, if you can find a bottle that looks like the modern bottle of Aramis, but it says Cologne, you know you're getting an older version. So they kind of standardized the bottles, if you will. Um, but this is what the vintage version looks like. This is an old tester that I bought, but even back then, look, the testers had caps. Look at the atomizer. Uh, you get the little bit of red around the bottom of the cap to signify that rose. I think this is supposed to signify the, the red rose that you get in this fragrance because that is the... Um, you know, that's kind of the selling point, the key of this fragrance. And someone told me, and unfortunately I can't verify it because I've never smelled Aromatics Elixir, but someone told me that this is like a masculine version of Aromatics Elixir, uh, which Bernard Chant also did for Estee Lauder, I believe. Uh, but this is Rosewood, Bergamot, Lemon, Coriander, uh, carnation, geranium, orris, jasmine, lily of the valley, and rose with oak moss, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, and civet. It is animalic, okay? So just like I mentioned, Aramis has that castorium note in the base with the leather. I think they use the castorium to create the leather, which is my favorite way of using castorium. That leathery note in the base. Here, they use civet. And you get that rose and it's one of my favorite rose fragrances of all time, actually. I think this is, you know, you this and um, there is a, um, there's a fragrance from the house of Azaro. And it's called, uh, oh, now I've got to look it up. Now I've got to look it up. Let's see, what is it called? It's called um, Actor. So here you go, Actor. This is the other rose fragrance I absolutely love. If you're on a rose kick, 
check out Actor and check out Aramis 900. And someone told me the version doesn't matter here. I always go for the vintage stuff just by heart because, you know, I, I feel like from what I've smelled, reformulations happen, changes happen, bands on oak moss and civet and all that stuff happens, or they just turn, or even if it's not a ban, you know, the company just turns the civet down because they uh, think that it will match people's tastes better, right? So the company just reformulates because they want to sell, they want to continue to sell an old school fragrance. I want the old school. So I go for the vintage, but if you can find this collection, by the way, is now completely discontinued, which is sad, terrible to hear. Um, but if you can find a bottle, even in the new version, it's still a good formulation from what I hear. Um, I don't think I've ever done a pure side-by-side -side comparison, uh, but this is what the vintage looks like. And uh, as far as a spicy, floral, animalic rose fragrance, I don't think you can do better than this, honestly. And I have no problem wearing women's perfume, as you know. Uh, I love things like um, Teatro a la Scala, Paco Rabanne La Nuit. I love... Um, you know, opium, stuff like that. I, I love wearing, and I will wear them. I don't just have them to have them. I will wear them. Even Dior's Poison, one of my favorite, you know, plum tuberose fragrances. Um, so I will wear women's perfume. I don't care about the gender. You know, um, if this is Bernard Chant playing a little trick on the men and doing aromatics elixir in a masculine bottle and making some slight changes and putting it out. I don't care. I'm perfectly happy with that. I love this fragrance. I love the rose note. It's so posh and it's so, it's so animalic while also remaining, um, while remaining beautifully, I mean, capturing the heart of that rose, you know, some men, smell rose and instantly think it's feminine, I disagree. I think it's very culturally sp specific because men in the Middle East wear lots of rose. Um, it's just, a, I think it's a Western thing. When Western men smell rose, they think, oh, it's feminine, it's not for me. Give it a try. I mean, early on in my fragrance journey, I had a hard time going along with a rose fragrance. And in fact, when I smelled um, Lyric Man, which is right here. This is the other. We just talked about my top three rose fragrances, by the way. Aramis 900, um, Azaro Actor, and Lyric Man. And um, so Lyric Man is the other one. And when I smelled this originally, I said, no, no way. Not for me. Uh, can't do it. I gave the sample to my mother, actually. And... Um, over the years, I've come around and, in fact, came around so much that I ended up buying a bottle. But um, this is 1973, Bernard Chant, Aramis 900. It is a must for someone that's trying to hunt down, you know, the best rose fragrances of all time. This is this is it for me. Okay, next we're going to go um, to a fragrance called Devon. And Devon came out in 1977. So we're jumping from 73 to 77, and this is a vintage bottle as well. Looks like this. The new bottle, like I said, looks like this Havana bottle that I have. They all look like this now, but this is what the vintage looked like, or one of the vintages. I think there's multiple versions that you could get, um, but Country Eau de Cologne, and as you can see, this one said Herbal Cologne Spray. This one says Country Eau de Cologne. So they are, you know, really pushing that cologne because men didn't wear perfume back in the day. It's not a perfume, it's a cologne, right? And this is an Eau de Cologne uh, strength that, same thing with Aramis 900. This is an Eau de Cologne or Herbal Cologne is what they say, but I think it's an Eau de Cologne strength in, in um, you know, uh, proportion of the alcohol in the fragrance and this this will send all of the other fragrances um, to the back of the line as far as the way it lasts the way it wears this does not wear like an eau de cologne this wears like a modern day eau de parfum to be honest with you 
It's uh, spicy, it's woody. There's that beautiful aldehydes in the opening. And I think what Bernard Schant was doing with Devin is he was taking that famous 1970s um, DNA, if you will. So if you know things like Alliage um, from Estee Lauder, if you know Chanel number 19, that green chiffre style, uh, wood, you know, woody and green galbanum and, and mugwort, uh, or Artemisia, whatever you want to call it, uh, that early, that that style that was popular for women, he kind of did the same thing he did with Aramis 900 uh, and converted it to a men's fragrance. So he took that green style and made it into a masculine fragrance, and it's absolutely beautiful. The green opening with the, with the mugwort uh, or Artemisia, the galbanum, the uh, lavender, there's a note of um, stone pine needles, and there's this cinnamony, oak moss, labdanum, and then that leather, you know, that leather that he does so beautifully in the original Aramis, you sense a little bit of that in the base down below. Uh, with the real oak moss in the vintage bottle, it's absolutely stunning, and this is perfect for me. This is perfect for spring and, and summer. You know, if I was going to wear, um, if I was going to wear one of one of these Aramis fragrances or two for spring and summer, there's this, and then there's one more coming up here in a little bit. Uh, but Devin is, if you're a fan of green scents, if you like stuff like uh, Synthetic Jungle by Frederick Mall, or if you like stuff like uh, Beach Hut Man by Amouage. You know, if you're a fan of those heavy green scents, I would highly urge you to check out Devon. Get it before the prices go insane. Even if you can get it in the current version, I would say just, just get yourself a bottle. Estee Lauder's doing some weird things with this gentleman collection. And the aldehydes in the top are stunning. I mean, these, these fragrances that we're talking about that have the aldehydic top, these right here, the original Aramis and Devon, you will not you will not smell a better aldehydic top opening in 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 fragrances. I mean, the aldehydes are in these fragrances are some of the best I've ever smelled ever. They're absolutely amazing. He was a master with aldehydes, um, and then he did it again with this one. Uh, this came out in '82, and this is a vintage bottle again. This is JHL. And JHL basically stood for Joseph Henry Lauder, which was the husband of Estee Lauder. And he used to like wearing stuff like Cinnabar, which I still haven't smelled. I need to, I need to get an, a vintage bottle of Cinnabar. It's on my list. Uh, and he used to like wearing things like opium, okay? And so in um, 82, they commissioned Bernard Schant and Josephine Catapano, who made uh, Youth Do. She was the original perfumer for uh, Estee Lauder's Youth Do in the 1950s, which was such a big hit among women at that time. And they commissioned her to make, and, and Bernard Schant, to make a fragrance for Estee Lauder's husband. And he kind of did the same thing he did with the last two we just talked about, you know, I mentioned Devin taking Alliage and uh, number 19 and Aramis taking Aromatics Elixir. Here, he took um, that Cinnabar slash Opium DNA and created an Oriental for men. Okay, so it was marketed for men. And this has one of the most beautiful, absolutely stunning aldehydic tops you will ever smell. The aldehydes that mix with the orange. There's this orange note. There is this um, boozy orange note is how I would describe it that runs right through the middle of the fragrance. So it's boozy, it's orangey, but it's aldehydic bright in the opening. And then it cover, and then it just kind of um, evolves into this cinnamony oriental with labdanum and clove and rose and sandalwood and vanilla and patchouli and it's absolutely stunning as far as this is one of the best orientals ever made i would put it up there with um you know i'd put it up there with opium and stuff like that it's almost like imagine if you mixed opium 
with youth do. It has a little bit of that youth do DNA because of Josephine Catapano, I think. Um, and it has that Bernard Shaw touch, if you will, but it has this modern, um, you know, this modern, well, modern for the eighties, this is 82, right? Modern Oriental that was so popular with fragrances like opium and, uh, JHL, so apparently the rumor is this is one of the hardest ones of all to find. Even in the new bottles that look like this, this is one of the hardest ones to find because they uh, didn't make as many batches because it wasn't as popular. Um, and so they made much more batches of some of the other fragrances. This one kind of got limited distribution. And when it was announced that Estee Lauder is discontinuing this gentleman's collection, this was the first one to go. So if you're like me, and you're a collector, and you like having the fragrances for reference slash wear. I mean, I wear these. I'm not just saying it to say it. I wear my collection. I try to rotate through. You know, I keep track of everything I wear, and I try to rotate everything through. I still try to wear my favorites more. You know, the stuff from the top of my favorite list, I try to wear the most of, but um, I try to rotate my stuff as well. And, you know, this is absolutely stunning in the winter. This boozy orange, uh, cinnamony, you know, oriental, spicy oriental with clove. It's, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, okay, now we're going to go to the other, what I would consider summer fragrance. Uh, this is uh, 1984, and this is Tuscany per Uomo. Now, again, this is the vintage bottle, and this is the bottle they actually took the DNA of, they took the shape of, to create the stock bottle that all of these fragrances went into originally. So Tuscany, this is what the old bottle looked like. It said Tuscany on the side right there. It had the star on the bottom. Um, and Tuscany per Uomo. So Tuscany per Uomo um, is this... Uh, I would consider it like a spicy, woody, um, Italian style fragrances, okay? So if you like the way that the Italians do um, citruses, right? So Italians like their fragrances very, um, you know, citrusy and fresh and bright. That's the Italian style. And Tuscany is kind of taking its cues from Tuscany. Uh, and you get lots of bergamot, lime, and lemon in the opening. It's very citrusy and bright and lavender. But you're also hit instantly with one of the best anise notes in perfumery. So when you talk about anise, you instantly think of things like Azaro Por Homme, right? This is a couple years after Azaro Por Homme. Azaro Por Homme was late 70s. This is 84. But that anise note, that sharp, heavy anise in, in, in the opening really catches your attention. It feels fresh. It feels sharp, bracing, clean. A little bit of, there's a, there's a little bit of a cleanliness to it, if you will. Anise has this, you know, like you just went and got a fresh shave from the barber vibe to me. And, but this also has oak moss, leather, basil, patchouli, cinnamon, tonka, and sandalwood in the base. So it has a base, but it's, it's fresh and um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that is dynamic. You can wear this in many different situations. I would have no problem wearing this in the hundred degree heat. I mean, I'm wearing a leather fragrance in the hundred degree heat today, so I wear whatever I want. But if you wanted to be season specific, let's say this could easily, easily be a, um, signature scent for you in the spring and summer easily. Uh, it's fantastic. And this one there are big differences between, I think, the, this version and the newer version because this version um, has so much more oak moss in the base and it's more leathery in the base from what I've smelled versus the newer version that I this is one I would really urge you to try to find an older bottle of, mostly because these, you know, citrusy uh, fragrances that are are meant to be a little bit more fresh in the 80s they had more heft underneath it because oak moss adds that heft to it and when it's taken away there's nothing they can do i mean it, it just feels like something's missing 
you know, they could keep everything else the same. The lavender, the anise, the orange blossom, caraway, tarragon, that could all be the same. But um, when that oak moss base is missing, it, you really notice it. And I think you really notice the difference between the vintage and the modern juice. So that's my talk on Tuscany uh, per Uomo. So then we're going to jump a decade later from 80, 84 to 94, okay? And in 1994, there's a spicy woody scent that now we've got new perfumers, okay? It's not Bernard Chant anymore. This is Nathalie Feisthauer and Xavier Renard. And this is called Havana, the one I've showed a couple times as an example of what the current gentleman's collection looks like, okay? So Havana, just as you can imagine is a spicy, woody tobacco scent, okay? So you do get that aldehydic top that Aramis is known for. I think they wanted to give a, you know, homage to the great Bernard Chant and the way he does aldehydes, and they did a good job, but it's not as good as the aldehydes in JHL or, you know, the original Aramis to me, but it's still a beautiful opening, and it's very unique. Even to this day, this smells very unique to me. Um, some of the stuff that I see it compared to, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, some people compare it to Montana Parfum Dome from 89. This came out in 94. This came out five years later. And there is a little bit of that, but it's really the vintage version. Parfum Dome went through different versions. So if you compare it to one of the newer versions, you won't understand the comparison. It won't make sense to you. But if you get a vintage version, yes. Um, this is kind of like the vintage version of Montana Parfum Dome, uh, but they've added this note of uh, tobacco here. And I don't think there's any tobacco in the Montana fragrance. And, you know, the tobacco is offset beautifully with the green notes. So you get this green basil, balsam firs, and then tobacco, cinnamon, leather, oak bark, Oak bark, not oak moss, oak bark, sandalwood, amber, vanilla, vetiver, uh, tonka, musk, and it's a beautiful fragrance. I think it's very um, versatile for a tobacco fragrance. This is one I could easily see wearing in the warmer weather, along with maybe like something like Creed's Tabarot Millicene. If you want to wear a fresh tobacco, uh, the Dreamer by Versace is another fresh tobacco. That was very popular in the 90s because freshness was a very popular um, theme back then. But um, Havana, while I like it, it's not my favorite tobacco scent from Aramis. My favorite is actually this. This is Aramis Tobacco Reserve. This is the one that I prefer as far as tobacco goes. It's spicy, it's smoky. Um, I wanna say this is done by uh, Edward Fleischier. I'm not 100% sure though. Uh, let's see if I can find it real quick, just so I can give you the name of the perfumer. Uh, who is this? Aramis Tobacco Reserve. So Fragrantica shows Edward Fleischier. Yes, it does. There's nothing on Parfumo, but Tobacco do, or, or uh, Parf, uh, Fragrantica does show Tobacco Reserve as an Edward Fleischier composition. And unfortunately, this is also discontinued from, from what I know and understand. And it's this tobacco leaf mixed with black currant, okay? So that's the rub. It's a very simple fragrance, but the rub is tobacco leaf mixed with fruity black currant, okay? So there is a little bit of sweetness here because tonka is amped up a little bit, but the tonka smells beautiful. It doesn't smell like the um, sickly, sweet, disgusting you know, synthetic tonka that you smell nowadays. It smells very natural, actually. And even though there's a little bit of sweetness, it never goes overboard to my nose. And there's a little bit of, you know, clary sage to keep it masculine. Dry clary sage with um, oak moss, nutmeg for a little bit of spice. And then finally, the uh, third most important note between the tobacco and the black currant to me is the iris. The iris here just does wonders. Um, and you guys know I love iris in a composition. And here, the, it's one of my favorite tobacco fragrances. I mean, of all time. When I rank my, this is not a top 10 tobacco list, 
I mean, you'll see how high this one goes. This is um, this is one of my favorites, Aramis Tobacco Reserve, and it only came out in 2018. It's a true underrated gem, in my opinion. Okay, let's go to the House of Papillon. So there's two from Liz Moore that I absolutely loved enough to just buy a bottle, okay? So I have two full bottles that I um, bought with my own money. All, most of these, most of my collection, 99.99% .99 of my collection I bought with my own money. I'm not getting free bottles from Roja Dove or stuff like that. Um, but this one, both of these are full bottle worthy. I can easily, if you have tastes like mine, I can easily recommend these, okay? So for the family portrait of Papillon, we're going to start in 2012, a decade ago. This is Anubis. And... Anubis, or Anubis, is supposed to be this leathery, smoky, immortel scent, okay? So if you're into the immortel fragrances, this is one to put on the list, but just understand, you know, if you're expecting something like Sunshine Man, this is completely different, okay? Because Liz Moore uses one of the most beautiful notes of labdanum, um, saffron, suede. There's a lovely frankincense here, this piney frankincense that mixes with the resinous, dark, smoky labdanum, leathery labdanum, and then that immortel adds this, um, you know, it adds a little bit of this, this dry brown feeling, you know, like when you look at the Egyptian desert and you think about, you think about the Egyptian landscape and how maybe there's a little bit of land around the Nile that's green, but then everything else is dry, right? That Immortel adds that dryness to it. And then you get this beautiful combo floral of Egyptian jasmine and pink lotus. And it's just done to perfection. And the way that this fragrance develops is what really got me. The development from hour one to hour five to hour eight is just stunning. I mean, this is a 10 hour fragrance on my skin. Nine, ten hours, easily. And I am a huge fan of her work. Uh, you guys know I love leathery fragrances. This is leathery to an extent because of the labdanum, but that suede. And it's supposed to be reminiscent of ancient Egypt, okay? So this makes you feel like you're a pharaoh. You know, you've got people holding the palm, um, you know, leaves fanning you. Uh, you've got, you've got, you know, the world at your fingertips. You're an Egyptian pharaoh wearing this. It will remind you of the landscape. It'll remind you of the uh, people that lived back then. And it's, it's just such a beautifully artistic fragrance. And, you know, you can smell the quality of the ingredients are top notch. And you can smell Liz Moore's uh, blending skills here. This is, um, this is why people go to niche. I mean, for the stuff designers are putting out, this is why people go to niche, and I really can't blame them. But my favorite from the brand, hands down, as much as I love Anu Anubis, uh, I think it's a fantastic scent. It just can't compete with this. I've mentioned my love for Diaghilev many a times, okay? If someone came to me and said, Ramsey, I've got, you know, $100 or 150 or 200 not 1000 like Diaghilev, but I want to get something in that animalic... Um, you know, animalic, floral, spicy, chifra fragrance, right? This is what I would point them to. This is Salome. I absolutely love Salome because the animalic aspect is used with um, a note called Hyracium, which is a very hard note to uh, conquer, if you will, because it's it's... If you don't use it correctly, you're, you're, you're overdosing the fragrance. Here, it's enough that someone like me who loves and yearns for that animalic aspect of things gets the, I get the hit of animalics that, I, that satisfy me, but it's not so much that it's unwearable. It's a very hard line to walk. You know, a little bit here and it's too boring for me. A little bit here and it's too much to wear. She just pegged it perfect on this fragrance. 2015, I think this is her masterpiece. Salome is, I mean, the jasmine in the opening, you know, and, and I know how much we talk about, oh, white florals, we don't like them, this, that, or whatever. The jasmine mixed with the rose and carnation is absolutely mind-blowing. It is just 
you know, orgasmic. It is unbelievable. Um, and then there's the Styrax, Oak Moss, uh, Orange Blossom. There's a little bit of bitter orange and bergamot in the opening, but it, but it goes into this patchouli. Um, it's just amazing. I mean, if I was going to wear a proper Shifra fragrance, this or Diaghilev, or Mitsuko. I mean, those are the kind of fragrances that I'm reaching for when I want to wear a true proper Shifra. And I mean, Salome is a revelation. You know, when I discovered this, I just went, wow. Um, and I love that. I love that DNA. I love that style. That's my favorite from the house. And then I just stopped discovering for whatever reason. So, uh, my buddy Nick sent this along, and it's funny because it says, Description of Contents, Cufflinks. Uh, thank you, Nick. Very much. I very much appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you uh, sending these along. And so let's open this box up, shall we? This is the sample set, I believe. And so, he said that he knows Liz more, and that he basically told her of my channel... And she sent him this sample set to send to me, which is very kind. So, Liz, I very much appreciate that. Um, very much appreciate that. Because I am excited to explore the rest of your work. So, let us um, let me get this out and I'll show you the, the sample set. And we will... You'll be seeing some first impressions of these on my channel, I guess, very soon. Okay, here we go. So first we actually have a fragrance called Hera. H-E-R-A. Now I don't know any about these, okay? So this is, you know, I'm, I'm going completely blind on these. So Hera, uh, Extra de Parfum, Jasmine, Orange Blossom, Elang, Rose de Mai, Oris, Narcissus, Heliotrope, Ambrette, and Musk. Uh, and Hera... Uh, Papillon. 2022. Okay, this is her new one. Powdery Floral Fragrance. Um, very, uh, very interested to try her work on stuff like this because there's also a note on Parfumo of, uh, Iris. You know I love Iris. There's, and there's a note of, uh, Clary Sage and, uh, Vanilla. And Labdanum Ambrette. I love Ambrette, too. So, can't wait to try her take on a powdery floral. And then next we have Anubis, which I just talked about. Um, we already talked about that one. And then next we have Tobacco Rose. So, this is an interesting one. This is one that if you said, hey, pick one that you want to try, this might be it. Because I love tobacco in a composition. Uh, it's one of my favorite notes along with leather and honey. And Tobacco Rose is one of her original ones from a decade ago, 2012. It's uh, Bulgarian Rose, Rose de Mai, Oak Moss, Beeswax, Hay, and Ambergris. So speaking of honey in a composition, Beeswax, and French Hay, Ambergris, and Musk, Geranium. Uh, wow, can't wait to smell this one. This might have to be the first one that we do. Uh, an early impression on. I still have one of the Spirit of Dubai's left to do. And then once that's done, I'll move to a different house. I have so many samples. Um, so many samples left to do still. You guys have no idea. So many first impressions and stuff like that. Uh, okay, so next we've got Spell 20, 125. Again, I don't know anything about these, so I'm just looking them up really quick. Spell 125. 2021. Okay, so this one is, um, this is, this must be the release right before her newest release, Hera. Uh, this is White Ambergris, White Ambergris, with uh, Siberian Stone Pine, Black Hemlock, uh, Omani Green Frankincense. It says Green Sakra Frankincense on the card. Interesting. Uh, I'm not familiar with that detailed of a specific breakdown. Ylang Ylang and Indian Sandalwood. Uh, spell 125. Green and Resinous. 
Very interesting. Uh, cannot wait to get into these. Can't wait. And then we've got Angelique. And Angelique is um, Osmanthus with White Champaca, Oris Mimosa, Frankincense, and Cedarwood. 2013. So this is after Anubis and Tobacco Rose. And Angelique uh, is a floral woody fragrance with Iris, Mimosa, Frankincense, Osmanthus, Cedar, and White Champaca. Interesting. Uh, and then we already talked about Salome. That was in her original uh, release, if you will. Um, in 20... In, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Salome was in 2015. And then we've got two left. There is Dryad, which I heard good things about this one, actually. Someone that I trust said they really like this fragrance. Uh, Dryad, 2017. So a couple years after Salome, we've got Narcissus, Oak Moss, Galbanum, Costas, Jonquil, and Cedrat. Uh, and Castorium, Civet. Okay, this is animalic. I, I, you know, I love, oh, it's a green animalic chifra. This sounds right up my alley. Dryad. I wonder if one of these will turn into a full bottle purchase one day. Um, and then finally, we've got Bengal Rouge, which I'm also very excited to try. There's so many. I want to try them all. Uh, Bengal Rouge. Well, now I'll get the chance to. Thanks to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, 2019. Okay, so Bengal Rouge. 2019. Turkish Rose, Sandalwood, Honey, Apopanax, Vanilla, Tonka, and Oak Moss. That sounds absolutely amazing. Sweet Myrrh is the Apopanax note. And Oris. Oris is listed on the card here, but it's not listed on Parfumo. So very interesting stuff. Cannot wait to dive into this. Thank you again, my friend. Thank you to anyone that's ever sent me anything. You guys are seriously... Um, way too kind, and um, I really do appreciate it. That's one of the things about this community. I hope the early impressions and the reviews, um, you know, help when you're making decisions, when you're learning about fragrances. That's why I do this channel. And, you know, these um, family portrait videos, uh, I, I used to do a lot more of, but I wanted to, I want to get back to occasionally doing them mixing them in with the perfumers portfolio and this year in perfume and then of course the early impressions and pretty soon I'm going to start doing more and more full reviews. I want to do more full reviews but you know I feel like I can do those anytime. I have full bottles of all of this stuff and but it's the early impressions that I'll probably wear, decide whether I want to um, buy a bottle or not and then move on. And so that's why I like to mix those in. That's why I've been doing more of those early impressions than I have full reviews. But I'll do full, I'll start mixing in more full reviews as well. So uh, to Lizmore, to Nick, to all you guys who are watching, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be doing this with you. I uh, love seeing your faces, reading your comments. I learned so much from you guys. And, um, you know, love the community that we've built. It really is something special. And, you know, this is my favorite part of the day. This and hanging out with my daughter are my favorite parts of the day. Um, and so I really enjoy, you know, it's great to enjoy something like this because I called this a hobby the other day, but it's really a passion. Uh, it is a hobby in a sense, but it's also a passion and a true love of mine. So thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate. I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye, guys.